Hello y'all, this is KW0415, and in this recording we're going to talk about the process of rebirth. How does that work uh, from a Buddhist context, more specifically the Theravada tradition? Because it's a little bit different in other uh, Buddhist traditions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to what I'm more familiar with, um, but I might have some side notes if I do remember any side notes from other traditions. And um, once again, the process of rebirth, I'm taking notes from the Abhidhamma, which is sort of like the highest teaching in Buddhism. And I will make sure that I put the source in the uh, description. Uh, last I knew, there was not an electronic version that was available, so you'd have to buy the book. Um, but we'll talk about that at another point. So what is sort of this um, difference that I talk about from reincarnation? So from my perspective, based on what I've read and everything, and everything about Theravada Buddhism, uh, reincarnation is about a soul that goes from lifetime to lifetime and is born. And a Theravada Buddhist perspective is that such, that such a thing does not exist. Um, it is um, just another thing to sort of cling to that keeps us in this round of birth and death and then rebirth and in this wandering sort of existence, samsara, as um, some people like to say that have talked about it. Um, so the big difference here is we're talking about a flow of consciousness that is not disrupted after death, um, after the time of death. And we're going to go through that process. And this flow of consciousness is fueled by ignorance, so not not fully realizing the Four Noble Truths and walking the Noble Eightfold Path, for example, not seeing the world as it is, and craving. So, I still want to exist is a craving that can keep us in this round of rebirth. However, when those things are extinct or they are no longer present, rebirth is a no-go because there is no fuel that keeps this going. So, what about this process of rebirth? How is does this work from a Theravada perspective, according to the Abhidhamma, or the notes that K-Dub took on the Abhidhamma? So, death occurs at the end of a cognitive process, or there's dissolution of the life continuum. Um, and this puts a being into death consciousness. So, in Buddhist philosophy, there's a death consciousness that is sort of activated at the time of death. And immediately after that death consciousness arises, rebirth linking consciousness arises. And so this is sort of the bridge to the next uh, the next life, whether what whatever existence that may be, whether it's the human plane, animal plane, uh, one of the Deva planes, non-returner, once once returner. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but there's that bridge. So that, that bridge is there. And that arises and then establishes sort of the next existence. Um, so the life continuum for that existence kicks in. And as mentioned earlier, it's um, sort of a flow of conscious that's fueled by ignorance and craving. Um, it's also through volitional formations. So those are intentional sort of actions, whether by the body, speech, or the mind. Um, so, you know, thoughts. Um, bodily action, and also our speech. Um, and these are very buried underneath. The, the ignorance, the craving are sort of buried there, but they're there, and they work as fuel. So they are embers that can turn into a wild flame. Um, rebirth can take place, according to Theravada Buddhism, in any of the 31 planes of existence Right now, presently, as you're a human being, um, if you are in some of the higher uh, deva planes, the non the planes that a non-returner goes to, um, then one will not come back to this plane. They will achieve nirvana in that plane of existence, and therefore there will be no rebirth because craving and ignorance are extinguished there. Um, which is very, it sounds very close to what Pure Land Buddhism believes. Um, and I don't know a lot about Pure Land Buddhism other than they sort of take as a meditation object uh, the Buddha Amidabha, who, is, who exists to show others the path to nirvana, even though 
that Buddha could go to Nirvana. So basically, um, a very devoted bodhisattva, um, a bo or bodhisattva, it, that um, will show people the way to Nirvana, so that when it comes to their time of extinguishing, it happens there. Um, and there, like I mentioned, there are some exceptions. So once returners, they will come back to a, a, a they will ex um, have a rebirth one more time, and then they will achieve that sort of um, uh, state or what have you, whatever nirvana is. Um, to be honest with you, it's almost indescribable. Um, even the texts say it's sort of indescribable. And non-returners that don't return to a lower plane, but instead at the extinguishing of their lifespan in the, in the deva plane, uh, they will achieve nirvana right there. Now, karma comes into play when it comes to rebirth, especially, and I mentioned before, when it comes to, there's that death proximate karma, for example, uh, that we talked about. So we're talking, uh, a monk may say, remember all the wholesome things that you did, so that at the time of death, you have a death proximate karma that may come into play so that you have a more favorable rebirth. Um, and it really depends on which one comes to fruition at the time of death, really. Is it going to be a weighty karma, for example, that comes to fruition? And let's say you did one of those unwholesome things, um, one of the five crimes. So let's say you murdered your mother, um, and that's that's weighty. Um, that's going to take precedent over other uh, karma. So when that comes to fruition, bye-bye to one of the 108 various uh, Buddhist hells. My favorite one is the one where... Um, a person, a person is being roasted over a fire like they're a, a stuffed hog or what have you. Um, that's one of my favorite ones for imagery wise. I'm not saying I want to go there. Um, and um, so it depends on the karma that comes to fruition when that next sort of link is comes to comes to pass. And not only can a being go down on sort of that hierarchy. But a person can go up in that hierarchy as well. That's sort of the wholesome karma. Think about the think about the virtuous things that you've done in your life, as opposed to the unvirtuous or the regrets that you had. Um, that's so that one maybe doesn't go down um, a couple notches uh, from the human plane. And um, it, it so the circumstances are going to be different depending on the being. Um, what their thought processes are, whether there's weighty karma or if there's death proximate karma that comes to fruition. Um, when that occurs, it's it's very, very complex. It's just about as complex as the law of karma is. And so um, rebirth, let's say that you don't believe in Buddhist rebirth, but let's just say for a second that it is a thing. So what about someone who doesn't believe? Well, ignorance of the law does not mean that you are exempt. Um, and I think most world religions that I can think of off the top of my head have a similar sort of philosophy where, yeah, you may not believe what we believe and you may be ignorant of what we believe, but it doesn't mean that you're exempt from any of the consequences. And it's the same thing from a Buddhist perspective. So I once jokingly said, and um, I'm sure other people have, said, other people have thought that, I, I said, yeah, for my next uh, for my next existence, I want to be a house cat so I can sleep all the time. And to be honest with you, that's more of a joke than anything else because as a devoted practicing Buddhist, uh, my ultimate goal is to eventually get to that enlightenment stage, that awakening, um, seeing the world as it really is, not as I as my sense organs perceive them necessarily. Um, so. In reality, I wouldn't really want that because animals have less opportunities to become awakened, gain wisdom. Um, and if you think about it, animals, well, for the most part, are driven by their instincts. Um, so the survival instinct is very strong in wild animals. And it could be in um, house animals as well if there are no humans around. Um, so that is sort of something else to sort of keep in mind. Um, when it comes to rebirth, it's like, yeah, I want to become a giraffe in the next life. Are you sure you want you want that? Where you could be attacked and killed, uh, just getting a drink of water in a in a you know an oasis um, by whatever predators you may have, like a lion. 
Uh, no, no thanks. Uh, that's probably not something I do want to sign up for. Sure, there are beautiful things about being a giraffe, um, but at the same time, that danger is, whew, that's really present right there. Um, even, you know, being stuck in a zoo, you know, you're not free to roam wherever you wish. Um, so even there, you might say, well, maybe not so much. And then you're reliant on humans for food and everything. So it, there are really some downsides to being reborn in the animal plane. Um, another thing you'll see is, um, I'm just going to talk about 31 planes of existence in general. I'm not going to be super specific, but I will put a source if you're interested in the 31 planes of existence description. So there are lower planes of existence, and they're considered sort of like the sense sphere because we have we have senses, and so we experience wholesome and unwholesome, right? Um, pleasant and unpleasant, um, and so. That plane sort of is made up of the hell beings because they experience a lot of displeasure. Um, there are planes of the hungry ghosts, and those are beings that are sort of... It's difficult to sort of explain. There are, li there are beings um, that are always hungry for something, um, but they don't have a mouth, and so they're not able to get those things. And the only way... And one of the ways we can assist a hungry ghost is to share merit with them, according to the Buddhist texts. So there, there's that as well. And then we have sort of the animal plane. So we have the animals sort of just um, hanging out there, um, doing animal things. And then we have a plane, um, I, we, I don't know if this is symbolic or if it is actual, um, of titans. And so these titans are always in conflict with the higher devas uh, because they want to rule. Um, they want power. And so they're always in conflict with devas, and they, you know, they have some minor victories, but they don't ultimately don't win because the devas are higher up on the hierarchy. And then after sort of the asuras or the titans is the human plane of existence, and the human plane of existence is considered very desirable because we, we as human beings do experience pleasant, we do experience painful, and everything in between them, uh, sort of on a, a spectrum. And we do have brains that are very well suited to gain wisdom. Um, and if we are able to use our time wisely to gain that wisdom, we can either have a more fortunate rebirth or achieve awakening right then and there in, in that present lifetime. And it's said that the state of awakening and enlightenment uh, from various sources um, will say it is not something that happens overnight. It doesn't happen, you know, on a snap of a finger or anything like that. It is something that can take multiple lifetimes to get to. Um, and it, it could turn out that in one of those lifetimes, there is a setback. Um, if, for example, if one is reborn in, a, in the human plane, desirable plane, right? But they are reborn in poverty and their family has been in poverty for generations. That is not considered sort of a favorable rebirth um, because when one is in poverty, it becomes very difficult to follow the ethical standards of a Buddhist practice, not, you know, abstaining from killing, from uh, stealing and, you know, sexual misconduct and um, false speech, uh, all those sort of things and intoxicants, you know, how many, how many people become alcoholics because they're in misery because they're they're in poverty i don't know um but that's certainly a situation for some people um so it becomes very difficult uh to uh, gain that wisdom and be virtuous in those sort of situations so there could be a setback when it comes to that and um it becomes a very complicated sort of process so um because in the present life i am aware of the buddhist principles and the uh, virtues that we're looking for, it is possible that at the time of death, I will have a more favorable rebirth into the Deva plane. And so they live much longer than humans. They, they only really experience pleasant. And that is actually considered a downfall, uh, according to many of the Buddhist texts and commentaries. Uh, because they only feel pleasant experiences, and because they live so long, they think, well, I must be immortal, and I must be so important, and 
uh, I'm never going to die, and this pleasantness is never going to end. And that's considered a downfall because that's not how it really works. That's not how it operates. The devas are not exempt from the results of previous actions with people and unless it comes to um, the extinction of those things through awakening and enlightenment. Um, so that's not really considered desirable. Um, if you are a non-returner, you're like in the top five planes of existence. Uh, so um, near that, like 31st. Um, and in those planes of existence, they achieve nirvana at the extinction of their lifetime, um, which can be billions of human years. There, there are some who have uh, calculated, tried to calculate based on the text, how long that is. Um, because there are some rough estimates in the texts, and then you know some people have tried to actually put that in the years, human years. Um, and maybe I, if I can find a chart for that, I I will put that in the description as well. And so think, you know, you live a million human years. How many humans pass away in a million human years? Um, and so you're think, and so the thought could be, I'm gonna live forever. Look at how many people are dying before even I, mean, I feel I still feel young. Um, so um, that's not really considered to be a desirable sort of place to be. It is very, it is very pleasant. But I mean, it's not desirable if you're if your aim really is nirvana. Um, the more desirable would be coming back to the human plane in a favorable condition, or one of the higher planes where you're either um, a non-returner, or if you're a once returner. Your, uh, one is able to maintain their wisdom so that they achieve it in another uh, rebirth, perhaps even lower than where they were. Um, so there are a lot of complications when it comes to this. And like I said, you know, law of karma really plays a role in this. Um, but that's the basic rundown. Um, for Theravada Buddhism, rebirth is an instant process. For other Buddhist traditions, it's not an instant process. There's there are intermediary stages. Um, so in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, which is a very, uh, that's a very general sort of branch of Buddhism, um, that is the situation where a person may actually be in this intermediary stage to sort of confront uh, their personal um, issues or demons, perhaps. Um, whether that's symbolic or actual demons, we don't really know for sure, um, at least. I don't, and the person that I know that practices sort of a Tibetan Buddhist tradition, he doesn't know for sure whether that's symbolic or actually practical. It actually does happen. Um, so, um, you know, that's as simplified as I can give rebirth. It's um, it's something that is really complex, and it's something that I try not to think about too often because then if I get caught up in that, I can really get clingy to, I want a future rebirth that's awesome. Um, and I try not to really think about it. I think more about day to day, moment to moment. Am I being virtuous? And um, event, my thought process is if I'm being virtuous, everything else will sort of take care of itself. All right. So, in the next recording, in the last video for this particular series of basic Buddhism, I'm going to sort of go over starting a Buddhist practice. If it's something you're interested in, great. I would love for you to stop by and listen to some of my thoughts. If you're not interested, that's okay too. You don't need to watch it um, if you don't want to. Um, but if you're curious and you're like, well, I'm not really thinking about starting a Buddhist practice, but I'd be curious to get some thoughts, um, you can go ahead and watch as well. So until the next recording, everyone, take care of yourselves and I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.